chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm picking up where we left off last week. Not last week, what am I saying? The uh, uh, week before last week, I wasn't here last week, which was unfortunate. Um, I always delight to be with, um, uh, with you all here in our local church. It was good to be with the um, Hackney Evangelical Reformed Church last week. Um, and they do send their greetings, not only their greetings, their gratitude for sharing um, uh, me with them last week. Uh, I do give thanks for those who were um, uh, serving in various ways, uh, ministering uh, last week, and um, uh, trust that you had a blessed, uh, blessed gathering. We'll be in 2 Corinthians 10, 7. And I'll conclude uh, the chapter this morning. Let's read the word of the Lord through His servant, the Apostle Paul. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's influence, area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Let's pause for a moment and ask God's blessing upon this, this morning's message. Great God and most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your revelation to us. Thank you that we who are weak, we who were apart from the Holy Spirit, blind, lost, we who are in many ways frail, have you talking to us in your word to strengthen us, to build us up, to encourage us. Yes, to challenge us as well, to change us, more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Please help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our series through um, 2 Corinthians as we think about strong weakness. Every, every day, I have reason to believe that many people's understanding of humanity is pagan, not Christian. And I say that of people within the church. I'm not talking about people outside. Every day, I hear things even from members of our own congregation that sound positively Nietzschean instead of Christian. The mentality that the weak, the frail, the abused, the poor, 
the lame perhaps in some way deserve it. That they are there to be crushed. And that we live life as those who crush it. Ideals and attitudes even of masculinity and femininity, which frankly are subscriptural or extra scriptural, that go beyond the image and likeness of Jesus Christ and look to sinful people to find in them their embodiment. Philosophies of the world either ones that make people stronger than they really are, or ones that would make people weaker, more passive than they should be, militate against the church, tearing it apart from all sides. This morning I saw, perhaps I shouldn't do such things on a Lord's Day morning, but I always, every morning, scan the headlines and I scan the highlights of what's going on even in the Christian world as well as more broadly. And I saw something about a popular Christian speaker and influencer who was speaking at um, a a men's event, some sort of, um, uh, I think they called it patriarchy con or something like that. And... um, 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 you, you, you know, he, he ostensibly was there to preach the gospel. But, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, ha- I have a great discomfort when you have someone who's preaching the gospel alongside a man who's bragging about how many women he slept with in his life. I have a problem with that. I don't think it honors God. You can preach the gospel in some other platform. You can preach the gospel outside to the men who are going to that event. Um, and and this, this is someone who has built his whole brand around masculinity. And when you probe, it is not even that which he is promoting. For it looks very different from the, the true man. The greatest man. The God man. Jesus Christ. See, I, I, this whole series has been about disabusing us with false notions of strength and false notions of weakness. We have to get back to that. And I believe it is in God's providence that this year, more than any other, for inexplicable reasons on one hand and some that could easily be explained, I have felt weaker than ever before. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually even. And for reasons completely unknown to me, um, uh, approaching our service this morning felt extremely drained. Why? Because God is teaching all of us the beauty and the power of Christ in weakness. We, we, We... see in the text before us strong words that should challenge each of us that seem contradictory and paradoxical. We see humility and boasting. We might say humble boasting. Is there such a thing as humble boasting? I think there is. I think the text presents us with an example of humble boasting. Humility is defined by some dictionaries. You could look it up, fact check me on that. Some dictionaries out there actually say to think less of yourself. To have a low opinion of yourself. Is that humility? Do you think that Jesus was humble? But did He have a low view of Himself? He was God with us. The eternal Word made flesh. The one who alone without any shred of self-righteousness could pronounce woe on one hand and could weep on the other. Jesus was humble. Jesus was meek and gentle and lowly in spirit. And He was kind. He was humble, but He also knew who He was. There is humble boasting. We're going to talk about that this morning. 
I want to encourage you to think that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but as C.S. Lewis wrote very helpfully, it is thinking of yourself less. Contrary to these dictionary de- def- definitions that imply it's about having a low opinion of yourself, humility actually involves, can we say, accepting yourself as you are with your good, God-made, God-given, image of God qualities while acknowledging your limitations. and it turns its attention to showing care toward others as you value and esteem them more highly than yourself and your own interests. That is humility. Various self-improvement sites, not even Christian, cannot escape fundamentally Christian values. One site listed humble behaviors because humility is not seen in the abstract. It is seen actually. Um, Humble behaviors are things like spending time listening to others. So, so you're not talking about your, and when you're listening to others, you're not listening to others so you can show one upmanship, so you can set up a conversation for the points that you would like to make, or for you to refer things back to yourself. But rather, it is listening to others in such a way that you are entirely interested in them. Learning about them. Learning from them. Being grateful for what you have is a humble behavior. Being generous, which we've been talking about from this very letter, is a demonstration of humility. Being welcoming and hospitable, including perhaps especially to those who are in some way marginalized or strangers, is humility. And I have to say, that one, that one catches me at times, doesn't it? Because um, uh, strangers, hospi- I, I've been to churches where sometimes I'm the stranger. And some random will walk up to me and um, say, can we, can we have you over for lunch? Church I was at last week did that a couple of visits ago. Um, uh, on the one hand, there was someone who, who was like, you know, I... Um, I think Ryan would like some space and some downtime between services. And so, um, uh, you know, he, he's going to, we're, we're going to treat him to a meal. And uh, I was like, oh, that sounds great. You know, what would you like? I said, anything. Well, would you like to go to a restaurant or would you like to? I said, you know what? Here's a quiet room no one ever goes in. We'll go and get you food. I said, okay, that's fine. But then a couple came up to me. I'd never met them before. And they said, would you like to have lunch with us? And I'm told they do that to people even who aren't preaching. Even non-pastors, just people. Would you like to have lunch with us? Were they wealthy? Absolutely not. Was there a lot on the menu for lunch? I seem to remember we had, um, we had some form of powdered soup. And uh, sweet bread of some form. And it was precious fellowship. It's fantastic. They weren't planning on hosting me. They weren't trying to entertain. They just wanted me around to show kindness. And I'll tell you, as I walked out of the place, there was another lady walking up. She had gone to a posh restaurant in this sort of gentrified area and had taken a menu from that restaurant and was going to you know, wait on me in this quiet room in the church building. And I have to say, the menu looked very nice. It had some very good options. But I, I was more blessed. I was blessed by that, but I was more blessed by the kindness of people to me, a stranger, sharing soup and bread in the unity of Christ. Humble behavior. Being patient and kind. There's a whole sermon about that just a couple of weeks ago. The meekness and gentleness of Christ from chapter 10, verse 1. But what about boasting? Because it seems at odds with all of that. Not least because we're encouraged to boast about our accomplishments. 
whether it's searching for a job or applying to a university or uh, simply just in the day-to-day of life. So much of networking is about one-upmanship and trying to prove something. And never mind networking, even in the context of Christian fellowship, you might find yourself comparing yourself to others or others to yourself. That is poisonous to the fellowship of the body of Christ, friends. Paul boasts, however, in this passage, there are things you can speak proudly about, but there are constraints. The passage before us presents a seeming contradiction that we we might call, as I've said, humble boasting. I personally don't think, though, that we as people have much of a problem boasting enough. We may, in general, have a problem with humility, though. So if if you... um, uh, decide you're going to play movie critic with the sermon and talk about, oh, the sermon was a bit disjointed this morning, a bit uneven with the pacing. The, 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 first, the first bit about humility went on and then he wrapped things up with boasting. That's intentional. We far too easily boast and we far too slowly are humble. I hope, though, that as we think about humility, it will shape our boasting away from the rebellious pride of Satan and more into the triumphant pride of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about humility from the passage we just read. First of all, humility faces the facts. Humility faces the facts. What facts? Here's one for you. Sometimes we don't see things clearly. Sometimes we're not looking at the full picture. Sometimes what you are looking at is not the right thing to be looking at. And sometimes what you are looking at may be the right thing to be looking at it, but you see it only in part. The Apostle Paul begins the text by saying, look at what is before your eyes. Now I know some of you may have translations that rephrase that. It is a difficult phrase to translate in the Greek. Is he making a statement? Is he making a command? Is he asking a question? And it does affect our interpretation just of those few words. However, contextually, I believe that the correct reading is, look at what is before you your eyes. He's getting them focused. Do you ever have, you know, in your life, in your workplace, in your um, uh, exercise, recreation, gym, some, some, someone who claps their hands and tells you to focus. Pay attention for crying out loud. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Look at what is before your eyes. Why? Because we don't always... We have a sight problem. We have an eye problem. Yes, this kind of eye problem, but this kind of eye problem is also an eye problem. We're looking at ourselves too much. And in looking at ourselves too much, we fail to see our neighbors, brothers and sisters in Christ, and simply those in humanity. And it it is a Tragic thing. Corinthians, look at what is before your eyes, he says. Not what you feel, but what is in fact real. Watch out for that in conversations, please. And especially if you're talking with me. Some of you already know this. If you come to me saying, I just feel that. We're going to get down to brass tacks and Try and figure out why you feel that way. Absolutely. But we're going to measure what you feel with what is tangibly observable before your eyes. The facts. Because sometimes, often, our feelings are distorted by sin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And so we shouldn't rate too highly what we feel in here. It's important. It will, it will transform your life if, if, you, if you stop living according to that, letting those feelings dominate you. 
We don't see things clearly. Not the partial picture that's been painted for you. He says, don't, don't look at the... So some people are in their church painting this other picture of what's going on with the Apostle Paul. And maybe there's some of it that's true and some of it's not. The type of person that he is. Don't look at the partial picture that's been painted for you. Look at what is before your eyes. The facts. The reality. Don't look at these narratives which are loaded with agendas and assumptions. Look at the facts. Look at the actual picture of leaders who love you, who care for you, and would lay down their lives for you. Because that's what's happening. They're questioning whether the Apostle Paul is all he says he is. Sometimes we don't see things clearly. But another thing. Sometimes we have poor memories. Is that true? Do we remember things well? Do we remember things rightly, correctly? It's interesting the, the games that our mind plays with us. I, I, I sometimes wonder if, if we were to um, record certain moments that are def definitional in our life and go back to them years later, would it reflect anything, our memory reflect anything that, like what actually happened? I've had conversations that I thought went a certain way, and then I go, I, I go back and, and I remember differently. Things where I have it in writing, I mean. And I'll remember something that was in, you know, we talked, we talked about this, we, we clarified this, and then I'll go back and I'll look and I'll be like, that's different from how I remember. But the facts are before my eyes. My memory tells me one thing, but the facts are saying this. Humility causes us to see that, and that causes us to be humble. It's a cycle. How, how do we see that in the passage? Am I just pulling that out of thin air? No, it's there. If, any, if anyone is confident that he is Christ's, that is, he is Christ's possession, he is Christ's treasure, he is Christ's belonging, uh, uh, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Can you hear the pain in the Apostle's voice? The disappointment? The frustration? The grief? That here is a church that is so absorbed in themselves and who they are in Christ that they have forgotten that this man that they're now abusing also belongs to Jesus. I... Um, I think in the USA, I don't know if anywhere else in the world, it's something called Pastor Appreciation Month. Some people ask about, well, Pastor Appreciation Month. In the UK especially, people will scoff. They'll say, uh, oh, that's, that's very American. And maybe it is. Please, no one misunderstand this. I didn't drop that as a hint. I'm not, <laughs> not asking, I'm, I'm not asking for anything. You'll see why. Pastor Appreciation Months exist because... Pastor appreciation does it. You don't need a month if, if you have a life. If you have normal routines and rhythms in the church. It's just facts. I mean, yeah, we have birthdays and I, I don't buy into that. Oh, every day is a celebration of life. I, I, I mean, I get, I get the meaning of setting some time aside for certain things, but... You know, I think the, the Apostle Paul is likely to say to something like that, you know, instead of a, a big celebration, instead of a one-off, I'd just rather you look at me like I belong to Jesus. Never, I'm not even asking you to treat me like an apostle at this point. I'm asking you to remember that I belong to Jesus Christ. I don't think that this is something that Frankly, we're always very strong at. Far too many reports that we got from the teams that um, went out this week doing door-to-door -door came back reporting positive interactions from people who profess to be Christians but have long been detached from local church fellowship because of how people treat each other, because of how they talk about each other, because of backbiting and contempt 
within the body of Christ. Because of gossip and turmoil that is deeply personal. What does that boil down to? When you talk about your brother or sister, do you talk about them as someone who belongs to Jesus? Never mind the pastor. The Corinthians were self-absorbed in their own feelings, so self-absorbed that they treated people in Christ, particularly in this case the Apostle Paul, with disrespect and disregard. They did not honor him. They did not submit to him. They did not listen to him or respect him and his warnings and his counsel and his advice. It all went unheeded. Inevitably to the detriment of individuals and congregation alike because the principle that he talks about elsewhere in his writings to them, when one is sick, we all are. By the time Paul is writing, they are questioning his sincerity, his spirituality, and some are even beginning to question his Savior. That is, they are adopting another gospel. And though, to be very clear, local churches and local church leaders today lack the authority of the Apostle Paul, nonetheless, this is an area of great relevance for our churches. Pastors and other church leaders are routinely disrespected and disregarded. Though they labor to be biblically consistent in faith and practice, many of those whom they care for have a casual take-it-or-leave-it attitude. Good faithful pastors live with urgency and plead with people to be reconciled to God and to enjoy the blessings of reconciled community with His people, but they find that the reception is often sluggish, casual, and individualistic. They feel thoroughly used and abused. That is, pastors feel that way. And I know I've spoken about heavy shepherding, and I know I've spoken about abusive pastors, and I'll get to that in a moment, trust me. But um, think about it. There may be one pastor, two or three elders in a church, 30 people, 50 people, 60 people. Just do the math. Who is more likely, mathematically speaking, to be on the receiving end of abuse and hurt? Is it not the one caring for the 60? Different people, different situations than the 60 who are being served by the one? Something to think about. And I say that as someone who has been very outspoken against abuses of authority. The Corinthians are not treating Paul very well at all at this point. Paul asks, is my labor in vain? Is my work in vain? And that is a sentiment many pastors feel. Their patience is taken advantage of. Their long-suffering kindness and gentleness is forced to give way to stern rebuke, which though they are required by Scripture to give such things in appropriate moments, such rebukes are almost never well received. Though they labor to see and serve Christ in His people, they wonder, do they see Christ in me? Do they see that I belong to Christ? And if so, why do I sometimes not feel like it? Paul is asking the Corinthians to consider that it's not just them. He too is Christ's possession. If only they really believed this, they would stop their gossip and slander and backbiting against Him. Or, or, or maybe, here's the thing, maybe they wouldn't. Because I, I, I seriously think that if the Apostle Paul himself was pastor of Grace Baptist Church Woodgrain, there would still be someone unhappy. If Jesus Christ Himself, I say if, Jesus Christ Himself is the chief over-shepherd of our souls, and we routinely abuse Him by our sin, by our rebellion, by our pride, not our humility. 
Maybe they were in the number who knew Jesus personally and saw His ministry, but who spoke against and rejected even Him. We should hope for better from those who believe in Jesus, but experience teaches us, tragically, even in ourselves, we have not honored Jesus as we ought. Are we all on the same page? These are heavy things. And maybe it's just that I'm feeling a bit heavy at the moment that's making me feel it more. But, but we, we, we must examine ourselves and take this seriously. If we would be a healthy church that honors Jesus and shines like a light in an increasingly dark city, we must get this straight. It's not just about how we treat people in leadership, though. That, uh, that does reveal our humility. That does reveal whether we've really taken stock of the facts. It's how we treat anyone who belongs to Christ. Do you treasure your brothers and sisters seated in this room? That's not to say you haven't had disagreements. That's not to say you haven't had your moments. That's not to say there's not been some tension or some strife potentially or reason even, valid reason potentially to have a disagreement or dispute. But do you treasure them as someone who belongs to Christ? Not abstractly, but really. Listen, I once preached at a church in our city that, uh, that communicated something that I, I came home and I told Eliana, I'm deeply discouraged. They, 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 there was a lot I was deeply discouraged about. Um, the most serious was people that I knew, multiple people that I knew who had left the faith. And it hurt me. But friends, what about those who remain? They told me that they were reeling from a season of substantial intergenerational division. And I wish I could say that this was a one-off. It is played out across church after church after church. The predominantly older folk had, as they got older, having once been young when they started the church, they looked around and they said, oh, it's all old people here. We, we need to pray to God for some young people, for some children. And God answered their prayers. He always does. The sad thing is, we're not always ready for Him to answer those prayers. He answers our prayers and we didn't actually, oh, God actually answered my prayers. And that played out in what happened next. It never occurred to them that God answering prayer would mean change. Various dynamics shifting. In the long term, at least after the new wore off, the initial excitement, they began to act put out by the need to show hospitality. The necessity of discipling new believers. The urgency of mentoring those without, as they perceived it, even basic things like good home training. They did little to come alongside their younger brothers and sisters to model faithfulness and Christian service in the local context. The sad reality about these older members, and it was, there were a lot of them. It's a large church. It was that they increasingly, as the church grew still more, it grew not because of them, but in spite of them. While they refused to obey Scripture with regard to older men and women teaching younger men and women, they were very exercised and vocal about petty things. So it's not like, okay, we're going to, to focus on the things that matter, things pertaining to faith and life and godliness to help grow a healthy church. But no, let's, let's channel our energies into song selections. Seating arrangements, personalities and cultures that we don't get on well with, various new aspects of church routine, similar things that we've done as we've grown, Bible studies and small groups and after service meals. Now, the young people were not without their faults, lest 
anyone rush to their side. They didn't really make the effort to get to know their older brothers and sisters. When older brothers and sisters tried to come alongside them and help them, they responded badly. Why are you telling me what to do? Why are they, why are they coming to me and bossing me about? They were self-absorbed, disorderly, undisciplined, irreverent, and casual in their approach to the Lord and His church. Their children looked set to follow in their footsteps and perhaps even be worse. If concerns were expressed about the perceived dishonor to the Lord and distraction to the church, those who might otherwise have been helped responded defensively and dug in their heels. And as I said, the sad reality is, this, though this is all quite silly and surface level stuff, it demonstrates a real sickness that goes much deeper down, militating against meaningful love in the body of Christ. Something has to give. This can be replicated in churches anywhere and everywhere, not only that larger, better resourced congregation. Indeed, it often is. Facts that we must face. We don't see everything. We don't have good memories. But another fact we must face, and this is a fact that Paul had to face. We have limitations. Do you see that in the, the text? We all must face these limitations. Paul faces vocational limitations. The authority Paul has, he says, is for building up. Do you see that? Even if, verse 8, I boast a little too much of our authority which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. So Paul, we'll get to boasting, we will get there, but he is, he, he, he's boasting at this point and he's humble. He's saying, I have limitations. I've been given a role, and that role is not to destroy you. And of course, the Corinthians can give thanks, because um, Paul does get a bit heated in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And one can imagine uh, what destruction he would be capable of if he were not showing restraint. His pastoral role, his role as... He wasn't a pastor, but he did have a pastoral role as an apostle, sent out by his local church to minister to church plants and other congregations that were already established, was not one of destruction, but of building. If only more with authority had learned the meekness and gentleness of Christ with which he began this chapter. And some might have thought I was being... Uh, very hard on churches and their issues. It's now time for me to be hard on pastors and their issues. As one who grieves, because I take the pastoral role and office, I trust you see it very seriously. And I, 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 I mourn because I see all around me and within me either the potential or the reality of character deficiency that must be addressed before the throne of God. It can either be addressed by people who bow before Him in repentance and faith and confession, or it, it, it will be addressed in other ways. God has His ways of bringing down the proud. Have you ever seen or heard disgraceful things like the following? I'm quoting from three different evangelical pastors. No, not the people who preach the prosperity gospel or anything like that. People with which we would have great agreement with their statement of faith. Here's one. He, was fi he had just announced that he was firing two elders. He said, They're without mi that they were off mission. Now they're out of a job. The reality was that they had opposed leadership restructuring plans that they believed as elders were unbiblical and unwise. Locating the power in one man instead of 
the elders plurally. This is what that pastor said. There is a pile of dead bodies under our church bus. And by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. You either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options. But the bus ain't gonna stop. And the dudes in the church <laughs> jump up. What a guy. Maybe a guy, but not godly. Here's another one for you. This particular pastor had unilaterally changed his church from a Baptist church to a Pado baptist church, trampling the will of his fellow elders, indeed forging their signatures, so that they resigned in disgust. He'd also stolen from church funds. No reformed denomination would ordain him, so he created his own. He mishandled scandals involving drugs rings and illegal casinos operated by church members. Some people were losing faith in his leadership. One could wonder why. And he threatened, there's going to be shooting in the bushes. People are going to get splattered. People in the church are going to get hurt. When I swing, people shatter. Families are going to be destroyed. Does our heart not break when we hear someone say things like that? I don't care the context. If the Apostle Paul said, my authority was given to me to an incredibly evil and dysfunctional church at times, my authority was not given to destroy you, but to build you up. Why can we in the 21st century with our chronological snobbery act like it's righteous and godly for us to bludgeon the body of Christ? Did not Jesus say that He came to bind our wounds? Did not God through the prophet Isaiah say, I will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flat, um, uh, smoking something or other. <laughs> well, someone will... Clue me up later. <laughs> Some sort of straw thing, I think. Or this one. A woman had left her violent and abusive husband with her children. Her husband's now serving extensive prison time as a child abuser and pedophile. The pastor's response to all of this scenario was to announce the woman's name to the Sunday gathering and say, this is what the Lord wants. He wants discipline to be put out of the church, to be publicly shamed, to be put away from fellowship. And I agree, this is what the Lord wants for her pedophile abusing husband. But it was her he was talking about. These are not nobody's friends. These are people that we all have esteemed at some level in our spiritual lives. May God be merciful to us for our lack of discernment at times, but also may He be merciful upon these men and humble them before it's too late. Paul's model of humility is one of building up even when it costs him. Even when it hurts, even when they are abusing him, he goes to them again and again to lift them up. There are communication limitations. Verse 9, I don't want to appear frightening. If only, if only when people write their missives. If only when people set out to tweet or to blog or to uh, Facebook or to text or WhatsApp, if only they thought this. I don't want to appear frightening. Because trust me, there are some who want exactly that. The text indicates physical limitations. Paul has personal limitations that he knows affect how people regard him. He knows people don't always like him. He knows they don't like what he says or how he says it. He knows they don't agree with his leadership style and that they aren't 
a lot of this has to do with that they aren't impressed by his physical appearance or his voice. He knows that they don't pay attention to what he says. As a man, he is regarded in the eyes of the macho culture around him as weak. Think about that, guys. It really is good to be a man. It is. Just make sure we're talking about the Christ man. Because some aren't. There are ministerial and geographical limitations. He can't do everything himself. He can't be everywhere at once. It's there in the passage. We'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach you. We're not overextending ourselves as though we didn't reach you. For we were the first to come with you, to you with the gospel of Christ. We don't want to boast beyond limit. So chasten our boasting with some humility and realize our limitations. And this is Paul talking as a pastoral character, an apostle. That there are places with thriving churches that he had nothing to do with. There are churches that were planted and revitalized quite apart from his influence. Had nothing to do with his network. I remember, brother, we were talking about churches and the ch finding churches. Um, and uh, and I, I, you, you're talking about you know, maybe looking if, if you ever were to move, going to... And you're like, it's in, it's, in, it's in Wood Green's network. It's in the Grace Baptist Partnership. And what did I say? There's this other church that this person's already going to. If that develops, look for a church that's near you, that you know and trust, that faithfully preaches the gospel. It doesn't have to be with a brand or a, some connection. Is it faithful? We're not a cult. We're not a denomination even. We believe in local, autonomous churches, knit together in the body of Jesus Christ, in good fellowship with one another, and that, that can be pretty broad. It can. Let's be careful not to make the, the path narrower than it already is. You know, Jesus said the way is narrow. Few are those who find it. But I do think that some are ever narrowing that gate. And that's poisonous. And it's not humble or helpful. Paul will not boast beyond limits because he knows his limits. It is pride, not humility, which keeps us from facing these facts. Paul, he has no desire to hype himself or his achievements. He doesn't pretend to be productive in ways that he's not been productive. He doesn't claim as his own work, work that he actually hasn't done. He, he, he is... He's not trying to tick the boxes. He's, you know, he, he, he's not reporting back to the church at Antioch stuff that he's not responsible for. He's not the only one who speaks truth. He's not the only one doing what he's doing, how he does it and why he does it. Grace Baptist Church Wood Green will not be a USP church that looks down at other congregations, God helping us and says... We're not like that church down the street. We are in a problematic situation where there are places that might be labeled churches down the street that preach false gospels. And we do not spare any, any sort of you know, fire on that. We have to be clear. I'm not saying lose discernment. Sometimes it's a tightrope to walk these things. It's a balancing act. But we're called to walk it for the glory of God. Humility fights comparison. It faces the facts and it fights comparison. When we face the facts, this almost stands to reason. Realizing our limitations, why would we want to play comparison games? Wouldn't we always lose to someone? Those who are destroying the church in Corinth claim to say it like it is. Oh, his, his words are strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his words of no account. 
And they rallied around these inflammatory words. They made Paul out to be quite pathetic and themselves out to be strong, wise, and impressive. They commend themselves while tearing down others. They are out of order. Indeed, people like this will stand before God for the many they have pushed away with their proud self-righteousness and aggression. And also those they have drawn with and to something other than Christ and His likeness. A crowd, just the ability to draw a crowd doesn't mean right, does it? Righteousness? I don't think mobs are known for righteousness, are they? Are we a church? Are we the body of Christ or some other gathering? What are we here for? These people make themselves the standard and they measure and compare others by themselves. When they, verse, verse 12b says, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding and one might also say accountability. There's no restraint. And there's only foolishness, never enlightenment. Paul embraces weakness and says later, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. How can we be proud, arrogant, haughty, rude, combative, abusive, hostile, self-absorbed, narcissistic, self-referential, and on and on as believers in a sovereign, good, and gracious God who in Christ loved you and gave Himself for you? Does that not contradict the Gospel? So long as you are looking down, there will always be people who are never enough in your mind. But start looking up at your glorious God. And start looking up at the gracious Christ. And you'll realize that you're no bigger and in many ways no better. You are not enough. Instead of looking at your brother or sister with contempt or condescension, humble yourself and look at them with Christ. Can we boast it all? I mean, maybe this is sort of a, you feel like, wow, I, uh, his humble boasting uh, is going to... He says it's about building up, but I'm not sure I feel a bit scorched from this, perhaps. You can boast too. Paul boasts. He wants the Corinthians to boast. What can you boast in? You can boast that you are Christ's. No, you're not Christ. You're Christ's. You, you belong to Jesus. And that is good news. You are treasured by Him. Loved by Him. He possesses you. Not Satan. Jesus does. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Individually and corporately, you are a prized possession, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen race. You have authority. Why? Because we believe in something called the priesthood of believers. That we all have access to God. And not only do we believe in the priesthood of believers, we believe in the prophethood of believers. That we all are to speak the truth with our neighbors. And not only do we believe in the priesthood and the prophethood of believers, we believe in the kingship of believers. That we will reign with Him. And we have a taste of that now in His kingdom. We, 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 we do not wield this oppressively or abusively, or as bullies, but as those who have our confidence in Jesus Christ. Not in our powers of coercion or compulsion, but as those who hold up high the cross of Christ and say, Jesus saves. And His message is compelling enough without me battering someone over the head. We do what we say. The Apostle Paul says what we read is what, what we write is what we do. And what we do is what we write. We're people of integrity and consistency. I trust. And that's something to boast in if you're a man or woman of your word. Better still, if you're a man or woman of Christ's word. And he says, finally, we reached you with the gospel. He calls them to, to, to grow up and he seems to indicate we'll reach others beyond you when you grow up. We don't commend ourselves. The Lord commends us. And therein we find our security. 
I don't have to prove anything to anybody. The Lord commends His people. And I don't need a vision or an impression or a word or something to shoot me in the heart and say, oh, the Lord is saying this to you. He approves. He's already told me. And those other things are helpful, potentially, if I've forgotten. Because there are people that God has put in my life who have spoken things, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, that I might have in that moment forgotten. That's on me. That's my bad. But God's already told me, and I just need brothers and sisters to point me back to what God has said. And you need me and brothers and sisters to point to you to what God has said. You belong to Jesus. Jesus loves you. Treasures you. Gave His life for you. And He's called us to lay down our lives as those who proclaim His gospel. When we bring together humility and boasting, it causes us to ask questions intentionally and strategically. Think about these over the course of this afternoon. What limits and boundaries do you have? What is the area of influence assigned to you? What influence have you built? Because often influence is earned, is it not? What influence do you have and how are you stewarding it to God's glory? Not to keep score, friends. Not to compare yourself to someone else. To make disciples. That's what this is about. To point people to the good news of Jesus. Pettiness and pride are a distraction to the church's mission. Abusive behavior undermines the church's mission. But humility in self and boasting in Christ will reach nations and save souls eternally. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that You would be merciful and gracious to us. Forgive us of our pride. Forgive us of our boasting. Forgive us of any condescension, any contempt. Be merciful to us. Lord, we pray that as we take the Lord's Supper in a few moments, we will remember that You humbled Yourself, Lord Jesus, Eternal Son, on the cross, giving Your life for us, that we who are broken might be healed that we who are lost might be found, that we who were sinners alienated from God might be drawn near. Please, Lord, be merciful to us and help us. Build us up. We ask that you, in your wrath, remember mercy. Do not destroy us, for Jesus has been destroyed on our, on our behalf. Heal us by his wounds. And may we boast in the Lord. Amen.